to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Listeners, if you're just joining in, Welcome to another episode of season two of our podcast. We began our first season back in July of 2020, and we spent over 30 episodes working through all the details of how a first century Jew would have understood the gospel. And our season one episodes really were about 95% teaching and theology on all sorts of topics like the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God, the age to come, the great commission, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, the turning of the Gentiles, and how really a first century Jew would have understood all those things. But for the second season, we wanted to help take those realities and apply them to discipleship. In other words, if the gospel is Israelocentric, if the kingdom of God is a future geopolitical reality based in a real city in the Middle East called Jerusalem, then how shall we live today in light of the certainty and the trustworthiness of God's promises? And so, we're setting out to interview guests where this gospel has deeply affected their lives, their ministries, their families, their jobs, their music, and so on. And so we want their words to be edifying and encouraging to you, really to hold the course with this gospel, to be a bold and a clear witness of Jesus, and to stay on the path that leads to eternal life in the age to come. And so with that said, on our show today, we have a marvelous comrade, a beloved friend, and a fellow sojourner and missions worker, Dalton Thomas. And Dalton and his wife, Anna, they're founders of Frontier Alliance International, commonly known as FAI, uh, and a number of associated ministries and organizations and production companies that all serve to exalt the worth of Jesus among the unreached and the unengaged at the end of the age. And so Dalton, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. We're super glad to have you. Thank you, guys. It's an honor to be on here. And now I'm going to be super ultra mega respected in the FAI community because all of our our crew (laughs) listen to the show. So this is, uh, you know, I get to now I'm legit. (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, why don't you give your uh, why don't you give our listeners a little bit more about you, just who you are? Tell us about your family and what you do, just a little bit of an introduction of yourself. Yeah, I grew up in Florida. Um uh my wife's from Georgia. We I met the Lord at 18. Uh wasn't raised in a Christian family or anything like that. Uh, my wife was. She's a uh, uh, daughter of amazing uh, parents who've been laborers and pioneers since she was born. We met in the South Pacific, got married, had our first couple kids uh, in the South Pacific, and then uh, we shifted attention to the Middle East in 2011. Uh, and that was ten, about 10 years ago, coming up in December. And uh, though there was a tension on the Middle East in our lives in a very focused way before 2011, 2011 was when the Arab Spring broke out. It was when uh, the Syrian revolution began. It, you know, there a lot of things happened in the Middle East that began to make uh, it, it, it wasn't we were looking at the Middle East before that. But then when everything began to, you know, erupt. We began looking in a more focused way, and that's when the Lord spoke to us to uh, to shift the attention for uh, what I believe then, and what I even more so now believe would be the primary focus of the rest of our lives, would, which would be pioneering Romans 15 uh, ministry in the Middle East, particularly in the Muslim world, no, though not exclusively. Um, but mostly the Muslim world in terms of, uh, you know, the largest demographic blocks of unreached, unengaged peoples. Um, the, the passage in Romans 15 really uh, decimated my life, the whole idea of I make it my ambition to not lay on another man's foundation. I was looking around me, looking at all my buddies and everything and looking at everybody Kind of, in a way, kind of ministry hopping, you know, you kind of every you jump to the next cool ministry and then you go to the next cool ministry I was going, man, like, what if this whole thing really laid hold of 
a generation that we said, I refuse to lay on another man's foundation. You know, we have a, 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 it it changes the game. I was just looking at the logistics of the practicalities of Romans 15, if you take it seriously. Like, what if all these capable, godly, hungry leaders, uh, instead of looking for another ministry or the coolest ministry to look to yoke themselves to for the next five years until they get disgruntled or burnt out or whatever, and they go on to the next one, why why don't why don't we think about maybe pioneering? <laughs> why don't we look at that afresh? And so that kind of became this like let's let's intentionally. I love the body of Christ. Um, I love it so much that I want to see it uh, grow where it isn't. Um, and because of that, I think we, we just made this conscious decision to, to stay to really avoid. Because if you're going to prioritize laying foundations where there are none, it means you have to avoid places where the foundation there are foundations. And that's not a wholesale collective thing because we see Paul is doing that, but then he'll go to Ephesus for two years. So it's not like you say, I'll never go, I'll never be around the body of Christ. It's not that. It's saying I'm intentionally orienting my life to prioritize foundationless areas to establish foundations. And so kind of the framework that the Lord gave us was, you know, uh, a very simple one, just an agricultural one of kind of a three just kind of how we evaluate everything. It's kind of a threefold process. We always say, "What phase are we in in a particular country? Are you in a seed a field securing phase, a feed a field seeding phase, or a field harvesting phase?" And it's a very important distinction because if you try to harvest in an area where it's you don't have access, there's never going to be a harvest. You have to establish access, but you can't just create access and then hold your access and never, never proclaim the gospel. So the seeding season is is so essential. But if seeding doesn't move to harvesting, then really all you're doing is just having lots of meals and coffees with people. And it's a massive waste of, of time, you know. So I think it's important to distinguish the difference between those seasons uh, in every area of the world. You know, if you, you can't harvest a field you don't own, you got to go secure it. You got to buy it. You have to find a way to own it so that you can work the land. And so that's basically what we've done for the last 10 years with, uh, you know, fruit that I'm very grateful for and tons of failures and lots of lessons learned along the way that, uh, it, but by the grace of God, we're still kicking and ticking and just grateful for his goodness. So it's, uh, it's been 10 years of, uh, blessing and trial and fire and fury and, wondrous things I, I couldn't ever imagine um, and some horrible things that I'd like to never imagine. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag the last 10 years of, of pioneering uh, pioneering this thing. And uh, so we're here in the Golan Heights now in northern Israel. I live about 10 minutes from the Syrian border, 15 minutes from the Lebanese border um, in a really cool little spot here in the Golan. And uh, from here before COVID hit, which is an annoying sentence that we've all got used to saying. Before COVID <laughs> hit, uh, most of my attention was on Israel and the Kurdish world. Um, I think the Kurds are a massive corporate collective people of peace um, that are very, I think, going to be instrumental. in. Uh, they're not the only people group I care about, but one that the Lord really instructed my family to prioritize. So that's kind of what we do. Um, that that's our main focus. We we basically use every means necessary to lay foundations. So I say, you know, if we get into a, co- a country or an area and the people say they like, you know, ice hockey, we're an ice hockey ministry. Like I don't <laughs> care, you know, what it it's not about I don't we do lots of medical ministry, but I don't care about medical really, you know. We do films, but to be honest, I don't really care about film. Like it's not something I wake up thinking like, man, I'm a dick I love film. Like no, it's a it's a it's a tool, it's a weapon, it's a method, it's a process, and but yeah, the the center of the the bullseye is the gospel. Yeah, yeah, I think you know the the longer you're actually in the Middle East, the more skeptical you become of kind of business as mission gurus and people who work from the outside but spread ideas about how you should get into unreached areas and once you're actually in the Middle East. It, Nobody comes to the Middle East to start a coffee house from the West. That's just dumb in reality when you're actually on the ground. <laughs> and so 
finding a viable uh, functioning uh, identity in the Middle East is actually not an easy reality. And, and the medical field, I think, is actually one of the most effective because you can tell people straight up, you know, God told me to come help people and because I love, you know, whoever you're among. I love them and I want to help them. And so medical uh, medical is the is what I'm gifted at and can help in that way. And so, so anyway, I appreciate what you guys do, man. Yeah, that's really good, bro. Um, I really appreciate the focus on Romans 15 and, uh, pioneer missions or pioneer ministry. I, I, I can, uh, relate to the, you know, just watching the ministry dynamic. I understand it's like this way, uh, overseas as well in the missions world, but here here locally, I find the same thing comes up over and over again when when speaking with well not even young i mean thirty forty somethings who there have felt a calling from the Lord to serve him in ministry in some sense for for uh, some time and and at thirty and forty they basically have exclusively functioned as a cog in the wheel and they struggle to see themselves in any other light and they are frustrated. And, and, uh, so I, I end up giving that same advice to people all the time here in the West. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I think this is a, this is a really big hindrance to even, even domestically here to people hearing the gospel is because so many people who may very well be called by God to uh, give their lives to the work of the gospel in a full-time way are essentially just working to be a part of the machinery of a large ministry and I don't I don't I think looking back we'll realize the fruitlessness of this but but uh on this side of it I think people struggle to understand where it's headed so I I appreciate that man that's I that's a big part of my motivation as well um, you know, I'd like for you to riff for just a second on how the gospel, as we like to call it, the gospel as a first century Jew would have seen it. How has that affected your life personally in a way that's kind of altered the trajectory of life for you? Vamp on that for a second, if you would. I mean, that's the question of, I was like, I think that's like the most uh, important question of my life, you know, because yeah. that is the defining issue. There is no other issue. You know, we can talk about a thousand other things, but that's the end of the day. That that's it. That's the whole thing. Um, it's interesting. I'll preface it by saying that, you know, we've, we've had a heavy emphasis in, in, on the return of the Lord, particularly the eschatological end of the age dynamic, uh, themes, in, you know, pretty much everything we've done. And a lot of people, you know, it is a barrier for a lot of people because it's, you know, for you guys know, for all the different reasons that people are, you know, uh, their parents were kooky and weird because they read this book in the 80s. So they don't, you know, or because of this or that There's a thousand reasons or just because they went to a Christian seminary, you know, and they got indoctrinated into a, you know, it's a system of thinking that's totally not you know, whatever the reason is, there's lots of opposition, you know, people being like, hey, man, we love your emphasis on, you know, uh, frontier missions, for example. But why, why do you got to do the, the 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 end of the age thing? I was with a, a one of the most kind of prominent leaders in the church planting, disciple making movement world kind of a thing. And and uh, he was like, look, you got to drop the you got to drop the end times thing. Like it's just <laughs> hinders church planting. I, I know who you're talking about, man. I totally know who you're talking about. That's hilarious. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, ah, uh, man, I love you, but I, <laughs> what gospel are we proclaiming here? And so I, I was exp- generally in those situations, while I can understand and maybe to a degree empathize with what they're, you know, saying because of the environment that they've been, you know, kind of born and bred in. For me, it's deeply personal, not because of, uh, you know, a teacher I really liked teaches it or something when I first got saved, but 
the bottom line is for me, I met the Lord at 18. My parents weren't believers. My dad was very hostile to anything spiritual, religious, anything um, with some trauma in his background. So anything associated with any institutional, you know, religion, spirituality was just pretty much demonized, you know. And then I have this encounter with the Lord at 18. And I came out of this like incredible, it, it, it was, I won't get into those stories now because it'll take way too much time because I, and I love talking about them. It's not relevant to this, but just very significant encounters with God, the Holy Spirit that I, that made me go, he's alive. Simply put, he's alive. He's not an idea. He's alive. Experiential, uh, you know, encounter stuff that was like, I have no, uh, that, you know, things that affected my physical body, like things that was like, okay, this is like, that is not an idea, philosophy. That, this is a legit, you know, thing. So anyway, I had this encounter experience, Holy Spirit thing happen at 18. And so I was just ravenously hungry. I didn't, I never read anything. I didn't finish high school. Uh, the only thing I read was surfer magazines. I grew up surfing. And so I hated anything like academic. I hated school. Um, I was intelligent, but I didn't like the confines of structured education. I just felt like, ugh, I just hated the whole thing. And uh, then I, I meet the Lord and I get ravenously hungry. And I, I go to the Christian bookstore and I'm just like, buying everything I can. So I, which I didn't know who to buy. I'd look at the words. I remember seeing Charles Spurgeon's name the first time and being like, well, how do you pronounce that? Spur, Spur- <laughs> Spur- <laughs> and I didn't know, you know, I, I pronounced the book of Job job. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. And so all the, all of my references for like where to draw from theologically, I didn't really know where to start and I uh, didn't really have anyone around we, I, all the, I led all these guys to the Lord in my hometown. We just started church hopping every night. So every night we go to a different church because we were just so hungry. So, you know, Monday night we go to Christian Alliance Church. Tuesday night we're at this Living Waters Pentecostal Church. Thursday night it's this like Gen X, like singles dating church kind of thing. It was like super weird. <laughs> but all these different churches. Anyway, long story short, fast forwarding. I go to a bookstore one day. I decide I want to go into missions. I'm in the South Pacific. I end up in this bookstore in New Zealand. And I buy this book just based on the cover. And it said something about end of the age eschatology. I didn't know what eschatology was, but it was about the the end of the age, something, something, something. So I picked it up and I was like, awesome. Anyway, it turned out to be a uh, dude who's not even a believer, you know, like kind of German criticism, higher education, like basically going through all the synoptic (laughs) gospels, showing all the inconsistencies and contradictions and showing basically why you can't trust the Bible. And uh, anyway, the point is he basically wrote this book about like uh, it's it's basically kind of a revisionistic eschatology based on a gospel you can't trust. Really, it was kind of like kind of like the just the logical conclusion of like building a system around uh liberalism really like theological liberalism that was like but you but i can see it the guy's probably sitting around one day being like well crap we didn't come up with an eschatology like we figured everything else (laughs) out like to deny the deity of jesus and the authority of the word but crap we didn't figure out the eschatology so we need to do that so to me it kind of right now looking back i can see that it was kind of a systematic work on you know kind of a, a liberalist eschatology whatever so anyway, I'm reading it and my my heart just sinks because he opens it up with, you know, a quote from C.S. Lewis uh, about how, you know, basically Lewis is like from Matthew 24 saying, you know, Jesus said that this generation would see it. They didn't. He's basically a failed apocalyptic prophet. It didn't happen. He goes into all that. You guys know that argument. It's a basic preterism, you know. And so my faith is just eroding. So I had this experience and encounter with the Holy Spirit that was life altering. And then all it took was this book to totally erode any confidence I had in in the authority of the scripture, which meant the the basic nature and character of God. Like I couldn't trust uh, John 3, 16 if Matthew 24 is false. And so basically the, what the Lord did at the outcome at the very beginning of everything with my walk with him is basically took eschatology and used it 
to save me from walking away from him and used it to put me on the rock of confidence that I can trust him. To, to summarize it, I, I, I was basically like, I have to read the entire Bible to like, if, if what this guy is saying about Jerusalem is true, I can't worship, I can't worship this Messiah. If what he's saying about Israel is true, and I didn't have any Israel framework, I was just reading, it just seems so asinine to me that a guy with a PhD behind his name would say, uh, you know, hey, this whole book that mentions Israel over and over and again, and as a new believer, you just assume it means Israel. And then I have this really sophisticated guy saying it doesn't mean Israel. I was like, if that guy's right, and i am just been duped, like, this whole thing, it, like, that guy's an idiot either way. But, like, this is really, like, I can't, I don't understand that guy for still, like, pr- continuing to, like, claim to worship. Like, what's the point, man? You can't trust, you can't believe anything. What's the point? So, for me, this is my kind of common response when people say, why do you care about eschatology? I say, because it is the gospel. Because it yeah. is the nature and character of God making and keeping promises. And that's really the heart of the gospel. It's it's God in the garden in Genesis 3 making a promise that he is going to bring an ultimate finality to not just the problem of evil, but it's something so much more catastrophic than that, that there is ultimacy, there is an eschaton already established from the very beginning, and that's the bedrock of the gospel. So when we talk about the gospel, I don't see how we can talk about it outside of its eschatological consummation elements of it. And furthermore, I think one of the reasons why so many people fall away and have such short-lived experiences in following the Messiah for a season, I think largely stems from the fact that we they don't actually have never connected with the gospel as it is, as the gospel, as you guys are articulating it, is the gospel as a first century Jew who is, our Messiah is a first century Jew. So, it ha- as he defines it. And I think when we rip the eschatological components out of the gospel and all we're left is with atonement, atonement is beautiful, but unto what? To buy right. people exactly. for what? Adoption exactly. unto what? Yeah. Justification unto what? What's what's yeah. the what's the point of all this? So yeah. it it basically it saved my life. It you know, I, I would say like I met the Lord, I got born again in 2013, but it took a year or two for me to hit a massive crisis of faith where I said, you know what, screw it all. And it was the day of the Lord and particularly his promises over Jerusalem that brought me to a point of total surrender to his word. So I think it's an issue of discipleship. Yeah, bro. That's huge. I I think that one of the things that we have said oftentimes on our uh, on our podcast here over and over and over again is that eschatology drives discipleship. It is the end goal is is what motivates right behavior, um, right praxis, right action in the present. Uh, and I share a simple analogy with a bunch of my students here all the time that I've said on the podcast a couple of times. I say, hey, what, what if I said to you, sit here in this room for the next 12 hours, and when I come back, I'm going to give you a prize. And the students say, well, I wouldn't be really motivated because you just said it's whatever. It's the, I'm going to get a prize. Are you going to come back and give me a nice little chocolate candy and say, thanks for sitting here for 12 hours? <laughs> Versus if I said, sit here for the next 12 hours. And when I come back, I'm going to give you a million dollars. And they go, okay, I'm a little bit more motivated. But then I say, sit here for the next 12 hours. And when I come back, I'm going to give you a million dollars. And here's the list of people that I've already given a million dollars to that you can text, you can, you can call, you can get their testimony. And how motivated would you be to sit here for the next 12 hours? Well, I mean, they go very motivated. Well, the mission that the Lord has called us to as disciples is not sitting around, you know, in our bunker with our guns and soup waiting for Jesus to return as we watch Fox News on our phones, right? Well, he, he's, he's called us to a very specific uh, uh, goal and, and mission to proclaim this gospel with boldness. And without that eschatological, not even just dimension, like as you're saying, eschatology is the nature and the character of God making and keeping promises. And so to have a, an understanding of the gospel without those very promises and, and the very goal of where this is headed, it stymies and, and prevents growth in the present. It prevents our ability to actually 
walk out the way that the Messiah has called us to walk in the present. So yeah, th this is huge, man. I, I think you're absolutely right. I've personally seen in my own life, just even the very reason why you said people tend to fall away, and I would completely agree with it. It largely stems from the fact that they've never connected with the gospel, especially in the way that a first century Jew would have understood it in terms of having not even just an eschatological dimension, but this is this is the thrust of this good news, atonement unto what? And that we would actually stand blameless before the Messiah on the day he comes to reign and rule from Jerusalem. So amen, bro. That's huge. Yeah, man. I, I really identify with that in a, in a lot of ways just because I came from... Uh, a radically unbelieving house, a principled atheistic house uh, of drug addicts, and uh, and so never having opened the Bible or gone to church or anything, coming to the Lord in college, you know, it was basically uh, I encountered the reality of God, and then had to figure out what eternal life involved, you know, and and so as you kind of work through issues over time, you realize that eternal life to first century Jews didn't mean floating on a cloud with a, a harp forever. It, it sure didn't mean the glories of the Constantinian reign and uh, or the fifth monarchy men or whoever you put, you know, in that slot. Um, it meant 12 thrones in Jerusalem. And uh, and that's why they're fighting over them to the right and the left. And, and that's what Jesus promises them when he sits on his glorious throne. And, and so I think there is that dynamic of just cut the crap, man, and tell me what eternal life involves. And if it, re if it involves the return of Jesus with fire and angels in the sky, it involves a new earth and a new Jerusalem that uh, has continuity with this one, then let's get on with it and believe it and, uh, and stop coming up with you know, bogus arguments to try to deliver Jesus and the apostles from the embarrassment of what, uh, of what you don't want to yeah. accept as, as reality, you know? So anyway, that's awesome, man. Love that testimony. Um, yeah. So tell us, man, tell us a, a little bit about, uh, Maranatha. FAI has kind of adopted Maranatha as a, as a slogan and, uh, and I love it. Uh, I think it's it's a great rallying cry. Give us kind of tell us how that came about and uh, the impact that, that that you've seen that have. You know, however, in your own life and FAI, that kind of deal. Yeah, I think. I mean, I've loved the word since I discovered it. Uh, I'm sure. I'm, well, I don't. I guess I, don't, I shouldn't assume. Uh, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, you you may have never heard it, but. Uh, it comes from the first Corinthians and Paul uses the, the term at the end in a very, very significant way. It's a play on words. It could mean either that Maranatha, the Lord has come or the Lord is coming or Lord come very versatile word. I've loved the word since I've read it. And it's always been something that, you know, we were kind of, uh, forged and formed in a community of prayer and missions. And so we're always singing, you know, always singing and, you know, we're always singing Maranatha songs. And it was always something that I love the word, but it was always like, you know, I love the word like I love, uh, I don't know, other words, I'm trying to think of another one, you know, Hosanna or whatever. There's all these, you know, Hallelujah. kind of <laughs> non-English words that we sing that we like and they're cool and they're kind of, you know, yeah esoteric we we're like you know what that means i know what that means hosanna you know so you kind of say it because people know but you don't really know yeah. the significance of it it's just kind of a a thing you know and so i like i love the word and uh that was that was kind of it we were very deeply rooted in all the maranatha themes but it happened a few years ago you know we we uh were maybe seven eight years into uh, the whole fai journey and I was asking the Lord, because every year I ask the Lord for a book to study for that year. And basically I read through that book if if it's, you know, uh, I just do one chapter a day for the month or maybe it's two chapters. But I break it up to where I, the book is, like say the Gospel of John's, you know, 20, 21 chapters. You read, I just do one a day and then gives me wiggle room to kind of miss days here and there. But it means every every day of the month you're reading through that book. So by the end of the year, you're so familiar with that book 
you memorized it, but you didn't try to memorize it. So it's kind of just my journey with the Lord has been this just over the year. Every year I just pick a book and I read through. I just go back. Okay. Oh, it's the, today's the first. I'll go back and read, you know, Exodus chapter one, you know, and then, oh, it's February 1st. Oh, Exodus chapter one. Oh, what day is it? 15th. Oh, Exodus 15. So it just kind of is this repetition to just get it, get it in me. And then, because the goal is in 20 years, I'll have 20 books imprinted on my, my memory, you know? And so that was kind of the logic in it. And so that year it happened to be first Corinthians, first Corinthians. And, uh, I get to chapter 16 and I'm just going through chapter 16 and I just get like, it wasn't like a discovery of like, Oh wow, look, Maranatha is here. It was this like, one of the more defining, uh, it wasn't an experience encounter where the Lord, you know, or like angels stand at the foot of your bed and command stuff to you. But it was, you, we've all had these seasons in the Lord and the word where it's, it's like, oh, this is more than just, I'm having a, a particularly anointed Bible study today. It's like, it began to unravel. Like my life began to unravel the next 20, 30 years of my future began to unravel. And it was like the Lord began to put things into place. And there's a bunch of dynamics to the Maranatha thing that we could, you know, you could do a 10 season podcast episode of a thousand hours on the dynamics of Maranatha. And we still wouldn't even touch the the center of it. That said, the thing that really struck me, which I think was timely and is timely about the Maranatha component is the way Paul used it to bring profound unity amidst such profound diversity in a season of history where the Jerusalem issue was a very defined, and the Jewish issue is a very defining one. What I mean by that is in the first generation, the dynamic was it was predominantly a Jewish community of, of followers of Yeshua. And Gentiles weren't really a part of the equation. And such that we read the book of Acts, and there's all these really significant moments where the apostles are being thrust out, rebuked, confirmed, encouraged, whatever, to to go out. And so we see a demographic flip in the book of Acts from being predominantly Jewish to predominantly Gentiles are now swelling and now they're proportional. Now they're growing and the Jewish identity of the faith is actually lowering. And we see a lot of the tensions of this, like in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, you see the clashing of these cultures as the demographic shift is happening. And what I noticed in Corinthians was that what the Lord was alerting me to was because I believe we're in a a moment of history where the dynamic with the relationship between the global Gentile body and the issue of Jerusalem and the issue of the covenantal identity and destiny of the Jewish people and the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem is actually going to become a and one of the, if not the defining issue for the global body. And because of that, the issue of unity, because there's lots of uh, things we could say about unity. I think a lot of it is sentimental humanistic unity. And I think what the Maranatha message, what Paul was using the Maranatha message to do would be to say, because really the book of first Corinthians is all about schisms within the body. You know, he begins the beginning and he says, look, let there not be, you know, divisions among you guys. And then he goes into basically trying to get people to the table of the Lord in light of the day of the Lord. So Jew and Gentile sit down together, break bread together, regardless of your ethnicity, your race, your financial income, your status in the culture, because he came and he's coming again. And so I saw at the end of the book, he goes, hey, guys, uh, I'm taking up an offering and I got to go back to Jerusalem because Jerusalem's still the center of my orbit, even though I'm pushing out into the Gentile world. Jerusalem is the center of this thing. And I want you to be aware of that. And I want you to give money to it. Think about that. I don't know any missions organization on the planet today who would go into an unreached people group. And then like three weeks into it, after making a disciple and establishing a community, say, Hey guys, we're going to take up an offering to give to (laughs) Jerusalem. You'd be like, wait a minute. This, what's, this is so backwards. All the types and shadows and fulfilling the blah, blah, blah. (laughs) And uh, that's what Paul did. We actually encourage new workers to, to, Train MBBs to give to Muslim background believers to give to uh, Jewish messianic movements. <laughs> and that usually kind of puts people on tilt that 
Because you just don't do that in the Arab world. <laughs> now I can say, I know one. I know one organization. <laughs> it's... It's it's almost anathema, for, you know. People would find uh, people find it so offensive the idea. You go, guys, this is the model of the Apostle Paul. He goes into a Gentile, unreached, unengaged place, yeah. lays a foundation, and then immediately says, "You have a debt of honor to pay, and you it, you should pay it." With there's an economic transaction that takes place there, and this isn't some sort of you know John Hagee expression of it. With all due respect to John Hagee, it's it's not. This isn't that. This is not let's give money and show our financial support in some political way. No. What he's doing is he's saying it's essential for a new believer to be connected to the covenantal identity and destiny of the Jewish people because in that bowl is the diamond of the gospel itself and the bloodline of our our hope. And if you take that away and you begin to become a predominantly Gentileized church— that has pulled out the substance of the actual gospel itself, the, the the trajectory of that thing is a not gospel at all. So I think what Paul is doing with the Maranatha thing is to say, hey, look, he has come and he is coming. And if you eliminate either of those components from the equation, you you, you don't have the gospel. This is the ballast of our, our unity, the central ballast of our unity. And I think, you know, we're we're at an interesting time globally because there's so much diversity in the body of Christ. There's a yeah. lot that's chaff that's going to blow away in the wind for sure that's not yeah. real. But there's a lot of real there. There's a lot of sincere. And there's a lot of beauty that we don't need probably, you know, we can't perceive most of that beauty because we're only looking with carnal eyes. I think the Lord sees a lot more beauty than, than we do and a lot more not beauty than we do. But I think... In light of that unique conglomeration of the body of Christ today and all of our extreme diversity, I really think that Maranatha is the best way to, to start conversations about what it means to be brothers and sisters in yeah. the covenant yeah. family or not. This is really the dividing line, you know? And so I think it's not, it may sound like a weird place to start the issue of unity, but if we're talking about eschatology and the end of the age, we're talking about Ephesians 4, which means this age ends with the church in unity and in maturity. So the question then becomes, what's the basis of that unity? And what's the basis of that maturity? And I think the Maranatha message is, you know, people have, you know, people are, people have sometimes said, and I think even John, you said it when we were just starting, kind of like, a corner on the market kind of a thing, you know, like, oh, that's the FAI kind of like slogan mantra thing. And I, on one hand, I like that that's that like people associate us with the Maranatha hope. That's great. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm like, this isn't us. This isn't our thing. This is not like a ministry slogan, like your, your yeah. vision statement of your organization. Like this is, this is the air we breathe. This is like, this is the snake. The, or this is the rod that swallows all the other rods. You know, it's it's the thing that eats and devours everything. And I think it's it when when the Maranatha hope lays hold of the body globally. Um, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. Where that will go. Amen, man. Yeah, I just love it. I love it because you get such a direct association between eschatology and evangelism and that the. The accusation that eschatology somehow distracts from evangelism, that just, yeah. man, that twists me upside down. That makes me insane because there is no, if, if, if evangelism isn't to save people from the wrath to come, if evangelism isn't in light of eschatology, well, what are we yeah. doing? You know, building houses and helping people and feeding people and doing good things that unbelievers do that doesn't mean anything. I mean, if, if eschatology isn't front and center and eternal life isn't what we're talking about and the return of Jesus isn't, isn't uh, the direction we're all going, then uh, it's just a mess, which, you know, if you're on the field for any amount of time, you realize that it's as big a mess on the field as it is in the West, if not worse. It's it's bizarre. It's bizarre, everything you get. So I just really appreciate uh, that emphasis with that push for for missions at the end of the age in relation to Israel. Uh, it's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like 
as a result, I mean, some of the challenges that you faced, Dalton, as someone who, even as you were talking about a little bit earlier, some of the things that have come to define you as an individual and define FAI as a ministry in the way that it it can kind of be seen by some as like, oh, well, you know, they've got the the missions piece. Let's let's focus on missions here. We love your frontier, your your pioneering heart, but just go easy on the eschatology. Or, you know, why does it have to be so focused on Jerusalem? And and I think in so many ways, as we've been developing uh, with you this episode, um, this is this is clearly something that not only has shaped you individually, but uh, has has shaped what you do in in missions and pioneering and frontier ministry. So what have been, even if you want to develop that even a little bit more, what are some of the challenges that you faced specifically related to eschatology, living in the Middle East, interacting, I mean, living in in Israel, in Northern Israel, I mean, right on the border of so many other nations that are uh, hating and despising Israel and the covenant that God made with them uh, and and their election. Um, what are some of the challenges? I mean, you can develop that or or anything else that that you think our listeners would would be able to benefit from. You know, I was thinking about when you kind of tipped me off to it before, like trying to think about to premeditate how I would answer that when you mentioned it. And I mean, I'm sure I can think of some, but to be honest, I I really only see opportunities and fruit. Like the only real challenges that come from an eschatological emphasis, the only ones are going to come from believers in the West who have nothing to do with it anyway <laughs> and who right. are have no, I don't want to say I don't have a dog in the fight, but they're, it's not, it's of no interest. You know, it, it's not, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was sitting with a, uh, it was when we had started a, uh, when we first came to Israel to work in Syria a couple of years back, we were working in Syria. And so every night, you know, we're on the border and we're doing stuff in and out of Syria all the time. And I'm sitting with a commander in the Israeli army and, uh, won't say what part of the army, but let's say it's a very significant one that has a lot of information and a lot of insight and makes very significant <laughs> decisions. Sure. And, uh, he says, you know, let me, can I ask you a personal question about your faith? And I said, yeah, sure, go for it. He said, well, I, you know, from time to time, he's like, I don't know any Christians, but from time to time, he said, we see here on the news, you know, these different people coming, and it was during the Trump administration, so there was lots of, you know, an evangelical pro-Israel thing going on. So there was a lot of, like, Israelis trying to pronounce evangelical at the time and asking what it was. You know, what is even evangelical? What is this word? <laughs> and because it was in the air, people were hearing it. And they said, they basically tried to research it on Wikipedia kind of a thing to understand what Christian Zionism is and everything. <laughs> and so he asked me this question. He says, can I, can I ask you, is, is this correct? I read it, or something online, whatever. Is you guys' belief that basically you're going to stand with Israel and love Israel until uh, basically the that um, everything's going to get Israel's going to basically get into a position of strength to where our foes, our enemies, are basically going to be, you know, Israel's just going to basically he's articulating in a secular way, basically like a post millennial, amillennial kind of a yeah. extremely yeah. optimistic Zionism, like. We stand with Israel because we want them, you know, they're going to be, if anyone comes against them, God will destroy them kind of thing. And it was interesting mm. to hear how a, a secular Israeli in the military was understanding Christian Zionism to mean we stand with Israel because we we disagree with anti-Semitism, we, Jesus is Jewish, all the obvious stuff. Um, but that the outcome, the end of our framework is that basically Israel is going to be in a position of incredible strength and power and their enemies are going to be humiliated because they've come against God's anointed chosen nation kind of a thing. Mm. And I said, well, actually, it's quite the opposite. I said, there are Christians who are like that. Um, but I said, it's quite the opposite. He said, I said, uh, so I tried to break down basically Jacob's trouble into a very succinct framework. And I said, you know, from, from the outset in Deuteronomy, the Lord said that when the strength and the power of the holy people is, is no more, uh, then there will be this reckoning and this encounter with the nation. And that then 
all their enemies will be laid to rest. You know, we look at Jeremiah, Daniel, you guys know the passages. It, the, the enduring testimony of the prophets and the apostles was there will be a cataclysmic battle over Jerusalem and Israel will be broken in the process. And in that breaking, the, ter- the veil will be torn and they will look upon him whom they've pierced. And so I said, basically, I said, I actually envision the, the border that we're looking at right now being violated by foreign armies. I envision the Golan Heights being overrun by foreign military. I see probably the road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv being cut and occupied by foreign forces. The Tel Aviv airport being no longer usable for I- Israelis and a massive population of Israelis having to flee into the desert and the wilderness just to survive and what will probably be the largest Middle Eastern refugee crisis up to that time, because Zechariah says half the city will go into exile. And guys, half the city of Jerusalem is no small thing. You know, we've seen cities like Mosul and Tikrit, you know, emptied and fighting, but Jerusalem, guys, to see, you know, mortars landing in Mamilla Mall and seeing Jerusalem overrun, like, that's a significant thing. So anyway, I finished painting the picture of Jacob's trouble and then the, the, the redemption at the end as well. And uh, he says, you know, in the army, we actually have this framework that you've described is actually a plan. Like we have a protocol for exactly, we call it the Jerusalem plan. And wow. it's basically if the borders mm-hmm. are overrun, the military withdraws into Jerusalem and fights for Jerusalem, mm-hmm. basically. Wow. And he said, there's wow. actually a whole mechanics in place for this very thing. And he said, I think, thank you for being honest with me. He said, to be honest, I can take that seriously much more than I can the idea that everything's going to be rosy. He said, because in wow. the light of everything wow. I know as a military analyst, like Israel's future is not bright. It's very dark. And we're going to, he said this, this, I got chills when he said it. He said, we will have to fight for Jerusalem. He said, we, we will. He said, and they're going to have to walk over our, the backs of our dead bodies to take the city. And I said, wow. can, I, can I read you a verse from Isaiah 51? Right. And, <laughs> and it says, all your young men are at the heads of all the streets like slain antelope in a neck. And your, your foreign oppressors say, let us walk over your backs to mm-hmm. secure the city. Wow. And yeah. he was like, whoa. And so my point in saying that is, Having an eschatological hope that's actually not rose colored, that's actually very open, eyes wide open about what the scripture actually says about the end of the age in terms of the dynamics before it, it doesn't give you less credibility in the Middle East. It gives you more and it doesn't close doors. It actually opens them because people take you seriously. Now, OK, take it to a Gentile context. That's a Jewish context. And I, and I do want to be clear. Your average Israeli, if you lay out Jacob's trouble, they're going to think you're cruel They'll say you're one sick bastard. You you think we built this country and we you know spilled our blood to pioneer this country and now it's just going to get you know blown up in this weird you know. Right. So not right. everyone's yeah. going to. I don't yeah. want to paint it like you know people are going to be you know high fiving you for laying out you know an eschatological gospel, <laughs> but I do think it is a much more thoughtful presentation of history because history is bloody. History is yeah. judgment and redemption. History is gray. History is not this, you know, uh, black and white dynamic that we see. It's like any student of Israel history knows, like the history of Israel is like, this isn't like a simple good guys and bad guys dynamic, you know? And I think we really need to be cleansed of a good guy, bad guy worldview, you know, which is, I think, a very American mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. of good guys and bad guys and look more like at everybody's evil <laughs> and there's only one one right. good guy and i think if you go into the middle east with that and you don't go in with like political biases where you just assume and you communicate everyone's evil uh you're actually and you do it in humility i will say that you do it in humility and tenderness and affection and you serve the people that you're saying it to you're gonna experience a lot more opportunities than you will opposition and I think you'll have way more relational equity in the end because of being honest. You know, it, there, there is an accuracy question. Then there's an honesty question. An accuracy question is, is the gospel we're presenting accurate? You know, if it's just Jesus loves you and I'm here to feed you or clothe you or bandage you because Jesus loves you. That's not that's not accurate. That's not why we're here. Right. It's accurate right. to say we're here because he bled for you 
and there is a window of mercy and escape, but the window is not going to stay open forever. That's, That's right. much more accurate. Yeah. But then you come to the question of, of, of honesty and that if it is accurate and that's true, you do have to walk in a, a level of integrity and honesty with the people that you're ministering to, to be honest enough to say, well, it's not just because I love you and he loves you. I have to be honest with you. Like, you know, my Israeli neighbor, I have to be honest with you at some point and say, I, I don't see your country moving into a brighter future. I see your country you know, moving into a time of incredible distress that you're not prepared for, that's going to eclipse anything you've experienced in the past. And more often than not, if you say it in humility, that kind of talk, I think, is going to open doors, not close them. That's awesome, man. I love that part about, you know, you actually gain, we we would call that an apocalyptic worldview. You you gain credibility for that in the Middle East and, and Muslims, by and large, hold to an apocalyptic worldview that history is moving towards a cataclysmic encounter with God and uh, and it's generally going to get worse uh, until that encounter happens and then it, there's going to be a radical transformation of of course Muslims aren't Jewish apocalyptic they they would be generally Arab apocalyptic but uh, but I you know I, I think that's part of kind of the disconnect of interacting with believers in the West that that you have such an infiltration of, of humanism and evolutionism and, and just a general embarrassment over that view of history that you end up getting all kinds of bizarre, weird theologies that uh, grow out of that. And anyway, that's cool, man. Brother, that was, that was, uh, really appreciate you sharing all that. And, uh, yeah, some of that is uh, really encouraging to hear, and 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 great to have some of the some of your perspective from being on the ground there, and some of those conversations. That's uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be really encouraging for a lot of the listeners. And just just in wrapping up, bro, would you maybe if you could just give two or three ways in which you would like to encourage the listeners of this particular podcast to stay the course with the gospel. Uh, what are a couple things that, that would stand out to you? I was, my wife and I were talking to someone uh, today just about this interesting dynamic that's taking place in the U S uh, with, from our perspective, I'm not in the U S so it's, it's basically perception. So I don't know if it's necessarily reality, but the perception is I'm, I, it's kind of like, uh, I didn't, you know, when you're a kid and you're playing sports, you know, with soccer or football or whatever, and everyone has different shirt jerseys on it with the team. And then you swap and you swap teams, you know, and you go put on a different jersey and you're for the different, you know, whatever. And depending on what team was cool at the time, it, it was be like, was actually winning in real time, like baseball or football or whatever. It would be like, that was kind of cool to have that one on, you know, uh, it, I think there's a dynamic happening right now in the body of Christ where there's two massive shifts taking place in the West. One is just people wandering off into oblivion and just walking away. That's happening. And then the other one is the people that are sticking around are basically just swapping shirts for the next cool thing. And I think the thing that, you know, there's lots of cool ministries right now that I, in the U.S. that I'm appreciating. You know, we listen to their music. We, I appreciate this. That's cool. But I go, ah, that guy just went from that one to that one. And I know it's purely because it's cool. Not because like, and you can make it into this whole spiritual story about how significant it is and God's doing that. And, you know, and I, I just wonder how uh, kind of heard thinking affects individual discipleship meaning yeah, yeah, like yeah, there there is yeah. this intent there's a if the motivation is not follow the bloodied lamb wherever he leads you uh, it's more let's put the jersey on with the most marketable ministry i don't know if that's discipleship and I don't know if it can bear the fruit of discipleship. And I'm not saying it's bad to go join a cool ministry. Uh, that's There's nothing wrong with that. I just think, I wonder how many capable leaders and pioneers there are out there who just 
because they've never heard someone encourage them to go do it, feel like in order to be valid in the kingdom, they have to go be associated with a valid ministry. So on one hand, we see a massive divide happening in the body. One is just people walking away, and the other one is people clinging to ministries. And I'm looking at this thing going, you know, there's a a famous worship leader, musician, gal, you guys would all probably know her name, she's on Instagram today, I see, and she's like, you know, I'm, I want to tell my testimony about how I was eating mushrooms, and once I walked away from the, you know, this destructive, abusive Christian faith, and I ate mushrooms, now my soul's free. And I'm like, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> so that's that's one collapse happening, uh-huh. you know, well-known worship leaders going into the forest naked to go eat mushrooms, and they're healing by, you know, getting healed by the universe. And then on the other hand, you have people who are, who did their stint with the the ministry that was cool five years ago that now is not because of whatever reason, be it you know yeah. economic troubles or scandals or the leader is now in jail or so whatever the issue is, and they still have a degree of sincere faith, but they're in a hyper uh, consumerized culture that if it's not on if it's not Instagrammable, it's not valid. And I think that those two dynamics, we're probably going to look back and say those two things devoured the body of Christ in America in the early 2020s is people walking away altogether uh, and then people clinging to ministries, not the gospel. And I think that's a massive thing that's happening that needs to be. um, We all kind of need to check ourselves. Like, look, I love I love our little dinky family, FAI, but. I'm not loyal to this thing at all. Like, this is not my hope. I'm not building. Who cares? This thing can go up. And, I'm not going to be in eternity, you know, a billion years from now going, man, FAI was so cool. They're going to be like, that <laughs> thing was a turd. It was like, you know, it was a train that couldn't barely make it up the hill. But by God's grace, we were able to bear some kind of fruit and hopefully help someone else closer to glory. But the point is, I, I'm I'm a very, like, because I'm, I just don't see a lot. I don't see hope in ministries. I see hope in the gospel. And I think mm-hmm. if we're going to continue, if we're going to stay the course and be faithful, we should serve and be ministry is to serve, right? We should be aggressively serving and be aggressive ministers and be aggressively in ministry, pouring ourselves out, using all of our energy. I'm, I'm not anti ministry. What I'm, what I'm saying is that let's, you actually give yourself to serving much more if you're not loyal to ministry, yeah. if you're actually being True. motivated by True. the gospel True. and not the ministry. And so and it, it frees you up to celebrate ministries and all of their warts. And it frees you up to not be affected by a ministry being cool or not cool, or you being valid or not valid based on the ministry you're associated with. Who cares? The most valid people in the age to come have ministries right now that people don't see as valid whatsoever because they don't even know about them. So I think the whole perception of what's valid needs to be brought in under the microscope of the day of the Lord and judged and evaluated on that, not on the basis of whether it's Instagrammable or not, or whether people are listening to the music and going to the conferences, which are dead now. Like the Lord killed that. You can't go to conferences anymore. Like people now are debating, like, can you even go into the building and what should you do if you can't? And there's all this stuff going on about buildings and attendance and everything. And I just think the Lord is, you know, that was a gift. I think this whole COVID thing was a gift to really say, hey, are you, uh, are you, and I'll, I'll end with this and just pointing out something that I, I've been mulling over. Isn't it amazing that this COVID thing didn't hit kids? Didn't hit little kids. Yeah, right. Seriously. Meaning it was like the Lord poked all the adults globally everywhere, but particularly the church, he poked them and said, okay, you don't have your building. You don't have your ministry. You don't have the income. You don't have the property value is going. Now you don't have all this stuff that affected church structures and ministry structures is now collapsing. And the Lord is like, I'm going to do that for the sake of the next generation, the kids that are growing up. Because they deserve something better than all this funky, you know, funky stuff out there right now. And I also don't want them to be physically harmed. I just, I'm just been in awe of the goodness of the Lord over sparing kids from being touched by this. Because actual pandemics in the past, you're, you're burying half of your family. Yeah. 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 Good point. It's staggering. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, and and I'm with you, man. As someone who ministers to college students, um, you know, and and seeing the way that it's so easy, college students and and young adults these days, uh, of course, you know, we know the the social media ec- epidemic, I suppose, or maybe even pandemic. <laughs> I have a, a seven year old niece as well who she doesn't have social media at this point, but she spends a lot of time. Um, in front of a screen and, uh, you know, finding her identity and, and you know, so many, whatever. I mean, I think of young adults as well and, and the way that social media has just shaped uh, the way they live and the way they think about themselves and, and the gospel and all of these things. So everything you're saying, man, I, I'm, yeah, I completely agree with. And, and this is definitely, man, a, a, an important, at least for a lot of our young and I suppose even our older listeners as well. You make some phenomenally important points uh, that are really, really necessary, I, I believe, to consider um, in light of ministry and the gospel and the day of the Lord and the age to come. So, amen. Amen. Well, yeah, Dalton, man, it's been super edifying and super encouraging to have you on. Listeners, we just pray and and trust that, um, you know, through hearing Dalton's words and his story and what the Lord is doing through him and through FAI, that you would be provoked and encouraged Again, to stay the course with the gospel, to boldly proclaim it, to live in light of his certain clear promises that he's made in the scriptures to the city of Jerusalem and uh, and to the Jewish people, such that that would overflow in the blessing to the rest of the nations in the age to come. And so we hope that uh, our interviews this season continue to uh, encourage and provoke you. And listeners, we love uh, your feedback, so feel free to stay in touch with us through the contact form on our website. Um, stay in touch with us on Twitter and uh, check out resources that we have available on our website. Uh, we've got um, FAI link there as well. Uh, so if, if uh, you do want to stay in touch with or you do want to connect with FAI, if you've never been in touch with them before, check them out, and uh, we'll put links in the notes to this podcast and uh, and and on our website as well to to FAI's website, faimission.org. So, anyways, listeners, thanks for joining us, John and Bill. Great to be with you, and thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.